begins. Wait, where is that? This is where the fun begins. <laughs> there we go. Okay. That, that, was, my line. Line. Yeah. that was my line. I was okay. going to say that. Okay, well, you, you can say it now. <laughs> Welcome everyone to Rule of Two. Today we have Paul Duncan, a very special guest who has written two of oh, my favorite books, which I'm still not done reading. I'm still reading uh, them. As you can see, they're quite large and packed with info. Um, this is like the holy grail of behind the scenes for Star Wars. And he's also written so many other books. And I was checking last night just to, to do my research. He also wrote an Alfred Hitchcock book. Yeah, I've I've written too many books, I think. That's pretty yeah, cool. Yeah, there's a Hitchcock book over there. Yeah. Which, uh, the first half of it is an essay by me, and um, yeah, it's got all his movies in. Yeah, I mean, I've I grew up watching movies, reading comics, um, yeah. you know, uh, reading books, and uh, my phone is on, so I'll turn that on. Here. Oh, um, that's fine. Um, and you know, I just love, I just loved everything that i was uh, connected to yeah uh, that, that i saw and read uh, a lot of noir fiction as well and mm -hmm. uh, and so that's what i want to do i want to communicate my love for all these things that i see and hear in the world uh, yeah. and i luckily i can do it through through books so i've been given that opportunity and you have a new uh, james bond archives book coming out yeah well it's new um, in the sense that it's got a new chapter on uh, the new movie, No Time mm -hmm. to, uh, to Die, yeah. uh, and that will be out. The book is all finished, it's printed, etc. It'll be out after the movie comes out. Of course. Because yeah. the book has spoilers. You know? Right, so, I assume. Uh, but, um, but that's... Um, uh, I cited that over 10 years ago where I, I did a book on all of the James Bond movies, uh, everyone ever made uh, went into the archives, dived in, and uh, the first person really to be given that opportunity and put it all into uh, into a big book. So, very excited for you to see that new book. I'm I have, I love the James Bond movies. I've been watching them since I was a kid. I don't know them as well okay. as Star Wars, but uh, they're very special to me for sure. Um, well, get the book and you'll know them as well as Star Wars. Yes, I will get the book. And I can't wait to see the new movie, which has been delayed a million times now, but I'm excited to see it come out. Me too. So going forwards with Star Wars, this book, there's so much cool info in there. So many things that I never knew. So many things that I've learned. Um, Mark, did you have a question? <laughs> no, no, no. I just want to say hi to the audience. I, oh, I, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, right. So Mark was like, you didn't even introduce me last time. And I was like, I get too excited. I'm, yeah. <laughs> How's it going? How's it going? It's this nice is... to see you, Paul. And I, I, uh, nice I got a you, bunch of stuff waiting in my brain to dive into, but um, it, it, it's good to be here. Yeah, let 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 me hog everything for a moment. Um, with Star Wars, like, how, how did you get this job to do these books? I mean, I imagine they must have taken a long time. Um, you sat down with George to to have these interviews, or how, how did everything work? Well, it, it starts off with a contract, like most of these things. Uh, Tash had a contract with Disney, and they added onto it a, um, a, a clause to do two books with Lucasfilm. Uh, and so, because I've done so many books with film books with Tash, uh, yeah, quite a few of them are over there. Um, uh, I was asked to basically to go lead on it and to do Star Wars. We had actually talked about doing Star Wars books before. Um, Often that Tash and a lot of ideas that go around and you, you you want to go forward with the right book at the right time. And um, so I got this contract. I went to meet um, uh, with people at Lucasfilm and Disney. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then it was a matter of getting everybody. Um, everybody's very busy, yeah. uh, me included. Uh, and so... Um, so we then arranged to uh, for me to start research. So really, it was a matter of once I started research, the book could begin. The first idea was actually to do one book with all six movies in it. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, so I went along and I was researching uh, episodes one to six as we were going through. Um, this is twenty. 
Um, and really it took four, four plus years to do both books. Where it started off as one book uh, with no involvement from George, it was just Lucasfilm Disney. Um, uh, then I got onto the, the ranch pretty quickly um, and I met uh, uh, Leah and the people at T at, um, at the archives. Um, and it was, you know, uh, I was allowed into the archives, you know, on the ranch. And it was fantastic. I, I had complete access, all doors opened, wow. roam where you want, make sure you wear the gloves so that you don't destroy anything. Yeah. Um, and it was just, uh, and, and that was it. You know, he says, right, there are all the storyboards, there's all the original art. Uh, yeah. At the Presidio, there's all the uh, photography, you know, and they would bring it all to me, box by box, um, all the original negs, uh, all the original proofs, um, um, it, into another archive at the ranch. There's uh, all the production documents, uh, because you have to know for all the negs, the original negs, you have to know um, the lens, focal lengths, you know, uh, when it was taken, who, what type of film was used, etc., etc., on every piece of film. Right. And all this was collected, you know, uh, together. And then at one point, um, so there's another archive with all the clippings, which is the research library at the main house. Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, and they also hold George's, um, all George's archives as well. Because George has his own separate oh, archive. Interesting. Okay. So, so I'm there, you know, for for months. So I'm coming back and forth, but ultimately I've been there for a few months, mm. and uh, everybody's, you know, gets to know me who are, who I am, both there and at the Presidio. I'm asking questions. Now the thing is that I am very frightened at this point, right? Because when you dive into an archive. Right, it's complete freedom. You can do what you like, you know, you, in this case, but you can think anything you want to think. You, mm -hmm. It's a complete blank slate. I had no preconceived ideas about what I was going to find. And uh, to a certain extent, uh, because there are books about the archives, you can only include what's in the archives. Right. So you have to, it's a bit like the horse whisperer, you know, you, you have to let the, the, um, the archives talk to you, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you, you have to see what's in there and what the story is by by what, what's being given to you, by what's been um, you're pulling out and what connections I'm making in, in my brain as I as I'm going through it. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's at a certain point I'm talking about it and I'm realizing, well, there have been lots of absolutely fantastic books um, done on Star Wars, not least by J.W. Rinsler. Um, who's done yeah. some amazing books. And at this point, I'd like to say, if anybody doesn't know about it, J.W. Rinsler, who, I, who I've never met, I've only read his, his fantastic books, is actually um, quite ill at the moment. And there is a, a, a Go, GoFundMe page. Um, and I would um, uh, uh, I would like to ask everybody to, to go and contribute to his medical expenses uh, at this moment and show your appreciation. For yeah, we did a stream a few days ago and actually uh, someone mentioned yeah. it and I, I put up the link yeah. and then I shared it on Twitter and I'm also gonna put it up now too uh, yeah. on this one. Okay. So I'll just, I'll just grab a it. Absolutely, he's done an amazing amount of, of work. All the making, the, the making, um, what was it? The, the art the, the, of the Revenge of the Sith, the art of Attack of the Clones, the visual sure. dictionaries, such amazing books that he's made. And when I heard that, I was actually quite saddened. Me um, too. I mean, th the thing is that when I started making books, I look to other books and I, I think, oh, God, those are great books. Yeah. And um, could I ever, you know, um, make a book as good as that? Right. Because that's always the, the fear when you're going into these archives, especially on, on Star Wars. And so I had to think, well, you know, Jay Rin Rinsler has done, done everything. What could I do? What can I contribute? What can I do that's that's different and going to be interesting and add to the collective knowledge? Yeah. 
and that that's the same when I was doing the uh, Charlie Chaplin archives mm -hmm. and the James Bond archives and Ingmar Bergman archives and all the other books that 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 I've done. And then, um, then about six months, seven months, eight months in, into it, I realised that. Well, really, what I'm interested in, as I'm, you know, reading all the documents and reading interviews and stuff, is uh, really I'm interested. What did George think? Because mm. ultimately, right, yeah. it's his baby, yeah. right. And I thought, well, really, if if I could have the book from George's point of view, as he's making it. Uh, and I can understand the decisions and his thought processes as he's making Star Wars, as he's writing it, directing, editing, yeah, you know, etc. Really, that's what I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. You know, more than anything else, that that was the thing I was interested in. Um, and so I said, well, you know, could I get access? You know, could I possibly get access to George's materials? You know. And so, question was, was was passed on, and the answer came back and says, "Yeah, you can, you can look at, you know, what he has in his archives, you know, because obviously different producers and different people kept different things." Sure. Yeah. Right. So, so I said, "Great, thank you, thank <laughs> you very much." And uh, and then a few months later, I I sort of got cheeky and I said, "Well, um." I have to explain that when, when films are being made, right, there's a lot of paperwork, there's a lot of paper trails involved. So when you're doing special effects, you will have um, special effects they were called at that time, they're now called VFX, but mm -hmm. uh, it was all lumped together. But when they were doing um, all the optical printing stuff and putting, uh, making mats and putting each of the images together, uh, in order to make one single image. Mm -hmm. These things were being redone over and over again. And I could see a f um, copies in different places, but not the originals, the original um, uh, documents that says what was filmed on which day. Uh, and then George had that file, which was great. But then there was also a file that says, well, George says no to that, no to that version, that redo it, oh, redo it, yeah. redo yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. And, and I was thinking, well, why is George asking that? And, and then on other documents, uh, normally you will have um, uh, on each film, uh, and this is consistent throughout in modern filmmaking, mm -hmm. there will be making ofs. Um, and uh, it was great on the, on the first movie because uh, Charles uh, Lippincott uh, had interviewed extensively virtually everybody involved in the production um, multiple times, mm -hmm. including George. George, while he's writing it uh, in different conferences, etc., with Gary Kurtz, yeah. with other people, etc. Uh, so he was actually um, he was actually taking note of what George was thinking at different parts of the of, of the filmmaking process. And I thought this is great. I've got to include as much of this as possible, right. uh, but not everything's in there, right? So, uh, so then I thought, well, let's ask George, see if he'll be part of the project. Right. Fingers crossed. Uh, yeah. Um, and luckily, he said yes. Nice. And cool. uh, uh, and so I got to uh, what day do you want? A day. Ooh. Yes. Okay. So, um, so I arranged for another meeting, a, 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 you know, research trip, uh, and I had a day with George, and I arranged it at the beginning of my research trip. And uh, uh, so it became a matter of me turning up, and uh, so I go into the main house, um, 10 a.m., uh, and George is waiting for me. All right, so shake hands. Get, get into the lift, go up and go to his office, see all the artwork and photography around. You know, there's Maxfield Parish. Um, in, in their main house, you've got Renmar and Rockwell and uh, lots of others. Um, you've got photography. You've got a, a chaplain um, 
image that I'd actually used in my chapel and archives and Lartigue and other great photographer photography in there. Plus he's got all the models and, and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, and and we sit down and and we'll start talking. Um he just said, Look, Paul, I don't want to do Q and A. Let's just have a conversation. Yeah. So um and that's what we did. We just had a conversation. So we sat down as you know, yeah. you are now, and we basically we just just talked. And obviously I had things that I wanted to talk about. And the, the things really I wanted to talk about were the were the themes. Yeah. Um about um what does so and so what's the rule of two? You know, yeah, where yeah, does yeah. that come from? Yeah. Uh, what are Sith Lords? Yeah. You know, what are Midichlorians? Yeah. You know, what the world, you, you know, the sort of basic stuff. Okay, okay so um, sorry to interrupt you. Sure. But you, but you just said, um, what are the midichlorians for? For just my personal, uh, you know, gratification. Do Do you remember what his immediate response was when when you mentioned that? Well, the thing with the thing is that I probably never actually said what are midichlorians. Right. 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 Damn. right. We we probably uh, what happens when in the conversation is is that. You talk and you see where the conversation leads. And not right. often the conversation is not about Star Wars, right? It's yeah. about the world and other things and things yeah. are going around. They form Star Wars. Exactly, right? Because Star Wars is not about Star Wars. Star Wars yeah. is about the world we live in and it's about a philosophy of, of life. Yeah. yeah. And what George is doing is he's encoding it um, uh, Star Wars in such a way that 12 year olds can understand uh, what's a good way to act in the world and what's a bad way to act in the world. Amen. Right? Yeah. So it's as simple as that. Now, when it came to midichlorians, really we were talking about uh, uh, symbiotic relationships at mm -hmm. this point, which is the idea that um, uh, we, you and I, right, as, as people, uh, and as individuals and as a group and as society and as a world are all connected but also we are all all connected to the smallest atoms you know in the universe plus to the biggest uh, to everything else in right. the universe galaxy etc right so it's a matter of ego right for us to think that we're anything more than anything else or anything less than anything yeah, yeah. else yeah that's so force. so so that's really the the midichlorians if you like was a way for him to express uh, the way that things that we are connected to the smallest parts of ourselves mm. yeah and the smallest parts of ourselves are connected to us yeah so so you know the midichlorians and the wills and all that sort of stuff he'd, he'd worked out because george is very he thinks all the, all the time he'd worked out the actual mechanics if you like all the relationships between these you know which which are in the book right so uh, so what what i would do is um i would listen and um and i, I quickly realized by the way that if i asked george well, what were you doing on December 10th, 1975? You go, you know, didn't have a clue, right? You know, I don't know what I was doing on December 10th, 1975. So, <laughs> so why should George know? Yeah. And then, um, but, um, so if, if I was looking for specifics like that, I had to find it through the paperwork. Mm. Yeah. I see. You know, through logic uh, and through specifics and what people said at a particular time because yeah. i've got all these interviews yeah. with, with all these people from the period from yeah. the time and so i can pick out what their knowledge is at that time yeah, yeah? um uh, i was going to make a point what was the point i was going to make yeah so um so the point is that i couldn't take those specifics from george i i very quickly after i asked a few of those questions and George gave me a, a sort of blank look. Mm -hmm. uh, 
I realized that really I had to come back to themes and the reasons why, right? Which of course, you know, is really all I need to ask George. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. And so, um, so that was from uh, 10 a.m. We then went to um, uh, downstairs to have lunch about one, something mm -hmm. like that, 12.31. Uh, and George says, oh, let's just grab lunch and come back up. Okay, so we went downstairs into the dining room, you know, got our stuff, and then went back up to a, a bigger table so that we could all uh, go around. And um, uh, and I remember I said, George, uh, I believe you're quite interested in editing, right? And uh, and then just you know let him talk about editing, yeah. Mm -hmm. So and then it became a matter of talking to George, you know, picking a subject, you know, when something finishes, just picking another subject and say, and, and let's just examine that. So yeah. we're editing. Um, George was saying, well, you realize that when when you edit, when somebody is going through a frame, right, it means something different. Because normally in the um, in the Hollywood way of doing things, uh, you would have somebody walking through a frame, right, leave the frame, and then there would be a cut. Yeah. So and what George says that when you know when he and people of his generation saw um, the work of Godard and Truffaut and Fellini and Antonioni and Kurosawa, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, all the big names of Bergman, uh, Sir Jack Ray, all the big names of, of the 60s. When they saw their work, they realized that actually sometimes they would cut before a person left the frame, so halfway through, or sometimes before they'd even reached the edge of the frame, mm -hmm. you know, and each cut had a different meaning. It had a different psychological effect on the viewer. Not that the viewer may notice, right? Yeah, or understand, but as filmmakers, they were taking note of this and they were saying, hmm, that's a different way of doing things. You know, the way that camera moved at that particular time, um, you know, meant something different. You know, why did Antonioni just move that camera away from the people? Yeah. Yeah. You know, why? Right. And yeah. they, what they were trying to do is trying to understand that. And what George was explaining was that he was taking that knowledge, right, and he was ap applying it to, to Star Wars. He was experimenting um, with Star Wars. So the wipes, the type of wipe, uh, uh, etc. It not only related to uh, Flash Gordon, um, mm. you know, the the serial, but also related to Kurosawa. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and, and so the use of it and the why of it and the how, um, uh, which one, which type you select, these were all things George was thinking about, and. You know he's talking about so he's trying to explain that these are all things that uh, were part of his his process and so th that then goes up to about uh, i don't know what time we we finished that first day but um it, it must have been around four or five o'clock um and wow. as it happened i was uh, so we said goodbye whatever and uh, george says well you know if you need to talk anymore just let me know and I said, yeah, well, I think it would be good because at that time I hadn't, um, well, I was doing all six films in the one book. I said, well, we haven't even talked about the, the prequel trilogy, episodes one, two, and three yet. So yeah. so we need to do that. And he says, okay, well, let's arrange a time. Yeah, cool. so, yeah. so I knew I was going back. And um, so I'd already arranged to meet with Ben Burt, who was in the technical building. So yeah. I left the main house and uh, and walked off um, to the technical building, which is down down the road in, on, on the ranch. Right. Um, uh, and George flies past me in his car, right, and waves, you know, like this out the back of the window. And, well, like uh, a Y twenty one speeder or like a golf cart or was he no, driving no, no, the no, Ferrari no. that they, they recorded for <laughs> the pod race scenes? No, 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 no. It, it, 
it was it was uh, i don't know anything about cars don't ask me right, right. all i know it was very low to the ground it was going very fast <laughs> right on the ranch which he owns so he can do what he likes yeah. and and he was waving so that was uh, that was it but but yeah cool. so so i got a second day uh, with him um and um uh, uh, and that was great um and then it just became a matter of going through the process i mean could, could i could i ask one quick question about because this is a very very interesting thing to me so you have one full day where you're talking to george specifically about his recollections his thematic connections to the original trilogy and then you have a second day where you're talking about the prequels what what do you think is the main difference between the way that he kind of reminisces on the original trilogy versus the way that he reminisces on the prequel trilogy? Like, is there a noticeable delta of, of thought process? No, not, not really. I, I mean, it's all one thing. I it's mean, all one thing. I, I, yeah, I mean, the, I, mean I remember um, we were talking about, because obviously there's a gap of 15 years between you know, um, yeah. uh, one trilogy and another, and uh, and I remember the whole thing of, you know, for me, right? Um, you watch episode one, then two, then three, then four, then five, and six. Mm -hmm. I know they came out at different different times, but for me, right, they're numbered, so you watch them in numerical order, right? And uh, uh, and. For George, it's one story. I, I see it as one story. Right. Yeah. And so, and so does George. You know that. So there is no difference. There's no difference, Mark. You know that. Um. You know, in terms of his thought processes, no, there's there's no his reactions to the thing. It's all the same thing. You've got to remember, it's the past. Right. It's the past for all of us. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um. You know that the past becomes one big. Um, uh, mass becomes one one thing, yeah. That we pick things out of, you know, things that we remember. So, um, so no, there was there was no difference, Mark. Interesting, interesting. I'm, I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask the big elephant in the room here without making a, a seamless transition. <clears throat> it's going to be very choppy. Where is it? Uh, what was his view on the sequels? I read in the book. You know, he had some very interesting. Um, ideas for it and he had several different uh plot lines and stuff but it, it, finally the one that you wrote in there was the one with darth maul coming back and having his apprentice darth talon which i thought yeah, yeah. was so freaking cool and luke banding together you know a, a jedi order of his own and then going to fight and uh dude it was so just please elaborate please tell me his thoughts recite well, everything from that conversation that you can please everything from that conversation is in the book. Okay. All right. So th there is no more. I was afraid. Other, yeah, yeah. <laughs> o other than me, you know, sort of like yeah. book eyed, saying, thinking, don't ask any questions, don't interrupt him, just yeah. just let him. Now I have to say um, that this was, this was the last day. It was the, it was the very last. It's the very end of the last day that that I got with him. So, um, uh, he never. To answer your question specifically, he never talked about um, uh, the other movies that came out. You know, uh, the seven, eight, and nine that came out. So he made no. So nine had already been out when you asked him this, or or seven and eight. Nineteen. It was in December. Nineteen. Oh, yeah. 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 So, so yeah, nine would have been done. Yeah. Nine would have been done. So he yeah, would have yeah. seen it. This is wow. Um, okay. So, but I mean, I, I'd already met him beforehand. Yeah. And, you know, it never came up. Yeah. You know, but for, for me, my idea was um, that I was, I, I needed an ending for my book. Mm -hmm. Right. So I wanted to ask George about really why he'd left. Um, uh, he'd sold Lucasfilm to, mm -hmm. to Disney. And, I mean, besides the obvious things, if you think about it, um, uh, George makes 
movies for children. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the only studio that makes movies for children is Disney. Yeah. So, so really, they were the only um, uh, choice, if you like, in terms of the t if if Lucasfilm was to continue. Uh, they were the only people in the market who, who would make those types of movies. The other thing is, obviously, George loved Disney. Yeah. Um, you know, he he was there. You know, he'd gone to Disneyland as a kid. Yeah. You know, annually. You know, loved it. So, um, but, you know, I already sort of knew that. And so, um, really, I needed an end for my, for my book. Yeah. Because even though I'm dealing with episodes four to six and then one to three in the two books um, the um, uh, they are in chronological order in terms of um, uh, 1999 2005 so I needed to have the, the ending so I thought I'd ask George um, why he sold uh, Lucasfilm yeah. and, and he said well he'd already started work on the, the sequel trilogy and he'd worked out that it was going to be, you know, 10 years or more of his life to to do it. It had taken about 10 years um, yeah. to do the first trilogy and 10 years to do the second one with all the pre-production, etc. You know, which people, you know, the film, does it doesn't start from uh, 99. Yeah. Yeah. It well, starts, from, starts from 94, yeah. mm. you know, in reality. Well, is that when the archives, uh, like, is that the earliest that you dated content that was specifically for the prequels was from 94? Well, actually, probably from the from his second draft in about 74 or 3, you know, because it's the first half of his second draft, his, his, his second full draft in the 70s. Is, right? is, the... It, is the prequels. God, right. wow. It, it, wait, it, wait a minute, yeah. you're blowing my mind right now. Well, look, if, if you have a look at the, he did a, a, a second draft. I can never remember facts and figures in my head, but it's in the book. Um, if, if you go back, he had a, a, a draft um, that was essentially the whole of the Star Wars. Do you know what right? page it's on in your book? I can bring it up right now. Um, I, I can't remember. <laughs> you know? <All> right. <laughs> <laughs> 342 but you're saying in the second draft yeah, of the no, original what, what happened was he did a draft and um, he realised there was too much in it it could never be made right mm. um, and uh, so we cut it in half uh, and he decided to do the second half of, of that script and then he cut that script into three and he made the first part of that and that's was what we know as Star Wars. Wow. I've hope. never read. I've never read this second draft. Is it out there? Probably. I think, mm, you know. Okay, that's interesting. Pro that's pro probably not officially, it. but yeah. it's probably probably out there. Yeah. And if you if you go, if you read it, if you finish that first, um, um, if you read it from the beginning, you see that that first half, although it's not exactly the same, you sure. know, as, as the prequels, it has elements that are there. You know, you have the right. center of the empire, which is Coruscant. You even have the floating tanks, yeah, in, in a parade, yeah, um, which obviously turn up uh, in the, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, in the yeah. droid army, you know. So, That's um, cool. so th there are all these sort of elements, all these parts that are all there, you know, that are there in that sort of fetus form, fetal form. Yeah. So, um, and all that all George does is he develops and expands on them as he goes through. As, as things become more concrete in the making of it, right, four, five, and six, when he went back to one, two, and three to do the first half that he'd already sort of, you know, had a version of, right. he had to break that down into such a way that would fit both what had happened in four, five, and six, and what his original intent was. Right? Now, if you have a look, um, people talk about family, etc. In in these early stories, in these first drafts, they're always the story of the father who sacrifices himself 
for you know for the prince or the son or or, or whatever There's some very moving uh, scenes in those early drafts where the father has become um uh, who's a you know a, a warrior a jedi warrior mm-hmm. who has um basically been replaced by all these machine parts he's more machine than man if yeah. you like um and there's a very moving scene in uh, in one of the early drafts where he actually in order to save the um the princes there are two uh, two children that need to be saved and um, he gives up he sacrifices himself by giving up his power pack yeah in order so that they can have this power pack in order to power something that will that will save them yeah so this idea of the self sacrifice is built in from the earliest drafts you know and the idea of a family connection and a father sacrificing is there from the very very beginning you know so so these are if you like ideas that are already in uh, in george's uh, drafts and what he wants is he wants to find a uh, a uh, Uh, a plot that will deliver these ideas yeah he wants to find environments a plot uh, characters that will embody these uh, psychological ideas that he has from mythology from joseph campbell and castanada uh, and everywhere else and then um uh, uh, and as he's making the movies it becomes clearer and clearer you know as in pre-production as the design team are designing things that he does designing the environments he says oh yeah i can use that yeah. oh no i can't use that but if they change it they turn it upside down or if they elongate it or you know it can become or they take different parts from these different ideas and put them together it becomes the idea that i need to tell this story yeah so um so whatever your original question was i hope it answered <laughs> There was something about the sequels and then Mark said something and we yeah. went off on this beautiful tangent. So it was great. Okay. <laughs> but okay, so going back to the sequels, because obviously, you know, uh, Nia and I are obsessed with that whole, you know, thing Maul that, coming back and, and yeah. Talon and yeah. Yeah, dude. To me, to me, the thing that I was most obsessed with when I talk about the sequels, and I would love to see if there's anything when you talk to George that echoes anything remotely like what I'm saying, but that he did have this overall intention to like you're saying maintain the family connection and Mm -hmm. that you know the sequel trilogy seven eight and nine were supposed to be as i've heard him say about the grandkids um so that's one thing and then the second thing that i've heard that i think is absolutely beautiful that i wish we could have explored more is this idea of him exploring to your point the kind of microbial subatomic layer of the midichlorians and kind of exploring that whole world and how that ties back into the wills and how the wills ties all the way back into the telling of a new hope and stuff were, were any of those elements discussed beyond the specifics of of maul and talon and stuff like that no not really because um i didn't want to interrupt him <laughs> but I, i think the the difference is this is that um the ideas he expressed before um he's talking about specific characters right and what is it was expressing to me was the overall plot of of what he had for the those sequels yeah so he didn't go into detail mm-hmm. about them and also we were sort of tying up so i didn't want to be in a situation yeah. where i was trying to you know trying to pump him for more information yeah when you know he'd all, already been so gracious to give me five days <laughs> yeah. yeah oh it was and, and he and he'd given me so much so and um so um so I, I accepted what he'd given me but but i think that you've um uh, these previous ideas that he expressed specifically on on characters and um, i'm sure those are part of this plot as well just because you see one idea he expressed in one place 
and another idea and another, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that those two ideas don't overlap. You know, often with, with George, and I've noticed this with a lot of uh, creative people uh, and stories um, that I've recounted, is that a, a person, a creative person, will think of, will be on a certain track, right, with one thing, and will follow it through, right, and then we'll understand that it doesn't work and then retract and then come back and find another path. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, but they already have these overall ideas, overarching ideas in terms of themes and, uh, and also in terms of plot, which they want to deliver. It. So they're not mutually exclusive. So I think that he didn't go into any other detail other than filling in about the midichlorians and, and the worlds, etc. Uh, and actually quite detailed, you know, if you have a look at um, uh, what, what he said. So, uh, sorry, I can't be more helpful oh, no. or, de or deliver to you what, oh, you no. know. Oh, this but, is absolutely great. This is no, great. Yeah. I mean, we're having I mean, a great but, time. Yeah, 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 we're both I mean, silent as, I think we're the most silent in this interview than any other interview because we're just, yeah, you know, learning. Um, so look, I must confess that I have not read the book. I have looked at the pictures and the pictures are fascinating. And I just, yeah. to me, it's like, you know, it's a picture, you know, it's a book with beautiful pictures. Um, sure. it's, it's much more than that. If you can and, indulge me, if you can indulge me and, and the audience, how would you briefly describe this over um, sort of overarching plot for the sequels as, as you understand it? Uh, for the sequels? Yes, for, this, oh. for, for these theoretical sequels. Okay. Uh, well, um, basically, it's exactly what, as you said earlier on, which is that um, what George was trying to get a, a, a across, well, and, and in fact, how we got into talking about it, uh, was the idea of the um, stormtroopers. And um, he said, basically, after a war, if you think of any war, right, uh, what does a war bring? It brings destruction. Yeah, I come from a, a town called Coventry. It was bombed and destroyed during World War II. They had to rebuild it. You know, um, I've just been to another town in France, uh, Le Havre, that was completely bombed out and had to be rebuilt. And this is the same in all wars, you know, that infrastructure is destroyed, but not just infrastructure, but the actual um, form of governance yeah, yeah, yeah. It happened yeah. in America too. The reconstruction is a huge part of our history. Yeah. So, so this is, um, so it's, it's not, it's day to day. How do you get drainage? How do you get clean water? Electricity now. Um, um, these are all things. How do you rebuild? Right. Um, and George says, well, this is, this is what he wanted for, for the sequels. He wanted to show, right. That um, and I remember this very clearly when he was describing um, the uh, the light side and the dark side. Yeah, in that the light side and the dark side, they're not binary. Yeah, it's it's not the idea you know of the yin yang where it's all white and all black, etc. He said it's a scale. You know, it's it's like this. Yeah, if you're you're on the dark side, all the way in the dark side. Yeah, uh, it's really difficult the amount of work you have to do to get back to the light side. And then when you're on the light side, you've got to try and maintain it. Yeah, you've got to work to stay there because the dark side is pulling you. Yeah? yeah, pulling you back. Right. Well, isn't it the same uh, after war? Uh, you know, a war in terms of time is it's, it's all about being destroyed. Yeah. The amount of time, energy um, uh, you have to put into reconstructing, yeah? The amount of goodwill, the amount of working together, yeah? yeah. As, a, 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 as a unified force in order to bring that together so that everybody can go back and rebuild it is like going to the, the light side, but it's something that you have to maintain. Right. So really, this is, if you like, uh, Ep 1, 
right? The light side, yeah? Mm -hmm. F2, 3, right? Mm. End of F3, definitely dark side, yeah? 4, 5, 6, really in the dark side. I see. But, yeah. but they're starting to pull back on F6. All right, from this point on, we can try and reconstruct, as you say, um, uh, the galaxy far, far away. And really, if you like, my understanding, my interpretation um, of what George said is that really 7, 8 and 9 was going to be that battle to reconstruct, to bring the galaxy back to the, to the light side. So this is the idea of, um, uh, of Luke uh, going out searching for those um, who are force sensitive in order to uh, bring them together, in order to train them as best he can, uh, in order to, um, to spread more good uh, in the universe and to, in the galaxy, and to um, and be a, a force for good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Leah, right, um, as George, I think, said, is obviously going to lead it. <laughs> You know, mm -hmm. the, the, yeah. whatever government or republic that's going to be, she has to gather all these different elements um, together uh, in order to create the governance, right, that can then spread out throughout the galaxy in order to, um, in order to bring it all together as a cohesive symbiotic whole. Yeah. And then um, what's fighting against that? As George said, um, you've got Darth Maul as a crime lord uh, and Darth Talon as his second in command. And they're really fighting for power. Yeah? Right. Um, uh, power and control of as much as possible. Yeah. Um, whether it's working for the dark side or not, it, it's sort of immaterial you know if you, right right because yeah. because really the dark That's side is, is not is not sith is it you know no, the dark yeah, yeah. you know you don't have to be sith to be on the dark side of course, yeah of course so um so the so this is this is my interpretation of what george's idea was would it, and he would, referenced as as in the um, um as in in the book he references the stormtroopers being like um, ex-soldiers, special forces, or whatever. Yeah. In Afghanistan or or wherever, uh, um, uh, or Iraq, and and you know what do they do after they're defeated? Yeah. yeah. So, so the stormtroopers are going to be looking out for themselves, and they're going to be they're going to say, "Well, we've got the guns." We've got yeah. the blasters, yeah. Right. yeah. Right. You know, we've got the armor. Woo -hoo. You know, let's go and, and create some mayhem. So, so this is the, if you like, um, um, th that's the starting point. For, but but oh, basically, a, but basically, what you're saying is it's a little bit like uh, Maul, Talon, and the stormtroopers are essentially kind of like a inverse rebel organization terrorist group that's kind of a crime syndicate going under the radar a little bit kind of guerrilla warfare if you will versus the kind of massive power that they had in episode you know four five and six well, um, well the thing is that they would still have that power would they not i, I mean the thing is i'm um just spitballing here because there's no sure. yeah, yeah, you know I, I don't tell me so are we yeah yeah all right, but um, um, logically, if you're occupying, if you're an occupying force in a uh, in, on a planet, right, and suddenly you find you've got no leader, then one of those people, or um, part of the occupying force, whoever is running it on that particular planet, is going to say, "Oh, I've got no boss. I think I'll be boss." Mm. Yeah. So you will have a, a, a number of disparate um, um, uh, groups, if you like. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then it says, well, 
I've got a Star Destroyer. Let's go to this other planet and let's take that over. And so they will, you will create like pirates or whatever going from autonomy, planet planet. essentially. Yeah. 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 So, so this is the, <clears throat> um, so this is the way that I thought of it. And then obviously you will have somebody who wants to um, get power over all of them. And right. this is where Dark Maul would come in. So, so Maul kind of comes in and sees an opportunity to fill a power vacuum that's sure. happening with these splintering uh, remnants of of the Empire. Oh, that's yeah. First of all, that's fascinating. Yeah, but it makes me wonder, you know, what was his original... Because, I mean, he couldn't have thought of that in the 80s. You know, there was no Darth Maul. Unless he had the idea for Darth Maul back, back then, which I well, don't I, think he the did. Thing is, the thing is, you've got to remember that George... Is a creative person, right? Yeah. So, um, you can't. Right, creative people do not. You don't. You don't make something whole. Yeah, you make something bit by bit, frame by frame. Yeah, on the not on episodes four, five, six, on episodes one, two, three, you make it pixel by pixel. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and um, uh, so you, you can't ex. You know, saying, "Oh, he didn't have this idea until, you know, yeah, not 19, um, 1985 or didn't have it till, you know, whatever, yeah, wherever." It, it it doesn't really matter, you know, because what what it is is a search for the right idea, right, for the appropriate idea at the right time, and um, that fits the psychology and the message. That you need to deliver yeah so whether it happens on set whether it happens 10 years before or whether it happens the day before the film is released or in some cases whether it happened you know 10 years after the film came out you know then you know the right idea is the right idea yeah yeah you're right. and it, it doesn't really matter when you come up with it yeah and i, I guess that's say, the one he would have used yeah, and uh, and the uh, what I think has been really interesting is that George has revolutionised the industry um, in the way that he's worked. Not only with the VFX, but you, you understand the idea of a non-linear editor. But, I mean, I'm sure you both use them. Of course. Um, Can you uh, explain? Well, exactly. Basically, if um, if you've got uh, a movie that's any length, right, and you uh, and you have it, um, you have it in front of you, all of it, all the time, and you can go to any part of it mm -hmm. and change any part of it at any time, mm -hmm. right? You edit it down, right? But then you can change any part of it at any time until the day before you or the moment before you release it. Yeah, so. So if you think of editing okay. in, in that right. sense, mm -hmm. right? Um, when George started, um, like with him and Walter Murch and all the others at uh, USC, they had to edit and cut frame by frame. They have to cut physically frame by frame, cut it, put it together, tape it, move on. And if they yeah. have to, had to make a, a change, they had to undo the cut had to find the other parts of the the stuff, the smidges as they call them, which is these yeah. single frames and little frames yeah, yeah, that they yeah. put in a box. They had to hunt through them in order yeah. to find them to put the frame back in. Yeah. And for George, you know, a single frame is is a world of difference. Yeah. So for him to um so that's what they had to deal with before in that you have to most productions, if you have a look at any film production, what they want is a script that's finished, right? You get the actors to rehearse it, you film it exactly, right? Preferably one take, and you edit together, <laughs> and it's, um, I'm talking in terms of production, uh, and you edit together, and there's only one cut because you've only got enough for, for each bit, uh, and you put the music and the dialogue over it, uh, and then you send it out. So there's no changes. You don't change anything. Mm -hmm. What George did with cinema, 
with digital cinema, uh, with, the, uh, with the prequels, with episodes one, two, and three, is that he put in place um, all the things for the first time in a big Hollywood blockbuster. I know there are other smaller movies that are similar, but for the first time, he told Hollywood that you can make an enormous blockbuster where you can get a pixel in, right? You can change everything about that pixel from the beginning of the production to the day before or whatever it is before you um, uh, you release it. And then you can project those pixels directly and they will look exactly as you film it and as exactly as the filmmaker wants, right? For the first time, mm -hmm. yeah? And George did that, right? Because he could change his movies anytime and that's what all this idea of him um filming going away for six months editing some stuff together doing more filming th these aren't um but they're not um they're not corrections or he's he's actually rewriting right in the same way that you would um make a, a file for um to, to write a, a treatment or a story or an email um, and then you will change a word or punctuation or, or, or the font or, or anything about that text to expand it or reduce it or in the end decide well just I just need one line here I don't need three paragraphs right mm -hmm. this is what George was doing with movie making right and he's the first one to do it on a blockbuster scale and yeah. he's the one that put in the money in order to yeah. develop these technologies and persuaded others to come on board. Yeah. Because it's not just about the editing software, it's about the VFX, it's about uh, the sound, it's about the projection, it's, a, it, it's about all these little things that they have to capture um, along the way and to change along the way. Yeah. And really, if you like, the sequels book is is about that that's one of the stories that that book is about not only about you know the making of the movies and the making of uh, and george's if you like philosophy the whole symbiosis and all this sort of thing but it's also about that journey how george um helped completely change the way that we now um interact uh, with movies this 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 theme, um, just to put a bow on the on the sequel conversation for my mind for now, and I'm going to keep doing lots of research after this. But um, in terms of carrying over the themes of family, like you were talking about a bit earlier, and um, and the father uh, sacrificing uh, for the children, um, were any of those themes also being brought back into seven, eight, nine as this journey towards the light side was? happening at the family level and um, i didn't discuss it you know i have to i have to be honest yeah, yeah of course I, I was i was going out the door you know it was sort of like yeah uh, and it was um uh, but no I, I mean it's um you know whatever george has said whatever you've read that's what he said and everything um is that i uh, that george told me is is in the book yeah, everything you mentioned is is in there, and it was is you started off I, with the stormtroopers thing. It was cool. Yeah, and I, I have to say that, um, you know, for clarification, mm. uh, at no point, um, um, did George George change any of the text that I delivered. Oh, that's great. So, so, oh, wow. uh, I um, uh, I sent all the text for both books to George and to Lucasfilm, right? And the only things I got back were corrections, you know, uh, consistency, you know. Right. Oh, you know, um, at that time, there was no name for this character. You know, it, it, it was just called, you know, Bobblehead or whatever, whatever it was in the script. So mm -hmm. let's just refer to it as Bobblehead instead of whatever 
you know, so, later, you know, they, they decided so, to call it. You know. So it's 10 p.m., you're in the archives, it's late at night, nobody's around. Oh, no, 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 no. That never happened. Okay, fine, fine. What, what, whatever, you think he's there with like a lantern and just like whatever, whatever, <laughs> take a cloak? I, like, I, I'm there with a lightsaber, you know, yeah, lighting yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah. But let yeah. me ask you a question. Never when you were rummaging around the archives did you come across something that said, wait a minute, this looks a little bit odd. And you sort of dust off the, the page and it says episode seven <laughs> written by Michael Arndt and George Lucas. Oh, jeez. No. Imagine. Oh, he's no. smiling. I don't know. That's a that's a very that's a very interesting smile. Well, the the thing is that when you're going through the archives, you never know. I mean, honestly, you never yeah. know what, what what you're going to find. Kind of exactly, thing. that's my point. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember looking through boxes. And I thought, what what are in these boxes, All right? And I found about four or five boxes of. Uh, Ewok animation scripts. <laughs> oh, that's first of all, that's awesome. That's awesome. All right, and you've got to remember, animation scripts. That it's not text; they're actually drawn out. Oh wow, that's cool. Wow. Not not the original boards, you know, but copies of them. Yeah. And this was like, I was I was thinking, why am I looking through this? No, it's my obligation. To, to look through all of these. Yeah, you know, I was actually looking at the Ewok chapter last night. That's funny you say that. It's right and at the but, end. But it literally, one of the things is that I found so much information, right, on the Ewok movies, uh, on um, the Ewok animation and droids animation and stuff like this, um, that I'm there thinking, I, I could do a whole book on just, you know, just the droids animation series yeah. there was so much material this is the this is the problem i have in that um uh, i could literally cover everything on books that big yeah um but no you you, you have to restrain yourself yeah you know? yeah <laughs> so I especially right now talking about it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. but, okay. but, right, but there was i'm getting very excited talking about yeah, yeah. books there yeah. but um but no, there is there is things that as you're going through, right? So for example, for episodes one, two, and three, there is um, they are taken uh, the drawers. The, the way it is on the main house, uh, there's the lower floor, right? Uh, then the first floor is George, George's office, etc. Uh, and then the, the floor above in the attic is where all the design team were. Yeah. And, and I remember that they told me in, in the archive, they said, um, oh, yeah, um, when they finished episode three, um, we just took what was in the drawers and we put them in these drawers, right? You know, so they have, like, these enormous, you know, uh, big, like, chests, yeah? yeah? yeah. And, uh, and nobody's looked at them since. Wow. And I go... Oh, oh, okay. Um, and of course, the first one I open up, right, was open it up. It's Eric Tiemann's, right? Uh, we've lost Mark here. Um, it's Eric Tiemann's, and it's, um, uh, it's his thumbnails from his first meeting with George, where George said, oh, we won seven battles on seven planets. Right, and Eric had thumbnailed um, the different planets and just given ideas for what they may be. Right, and that's literally, literally the first thing I pull out. Right. Wow. And, like and I'm beginning. thinking, and, and I'm thinking, no matter what, no matter what happens in this project, this will be in the book. You know, these pages will right. be in the book. Because yeah. how can I, I not? You know, because yeah. because what I'm what I'm trying to do is to give an oral history of people actually talking about um, what they did in their work and why, mm -hmm. right? What the process was, so that you can see the development of the ideas um, and of the design and of the, the making of it. And here is a 
is is a key piece of 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 art yeah because it shows george's original idea and how eric has interpreted that idea yeah and and it, in fact this is before it was two books and what happened was that i i asked i found so much fabulous material as you can imagine i'm there i'm picking up original ralph macquarie artwork yeah. i'm picking up the original doug chan artwork Price. yeah and joe johnston and, and, yeah, yeah. and all the others and uh and i'm thinking there's so much here e mckay he said i'm thinking how can i you know how can i fit all this into like one book and so i talked to both lucasfilm and um benedict Ashen, the publisher and um and i asked them and i said well would it be a problem if i divided it into two books because they naturally fall into trilogies right. yeah. and luckily both of them said okay fine and um uh, and so that happened you know, so was there any chatter be, because i'm so excited about this and hopefully theory and i will get to go to the opening maybe um hmm. but was there any chatter <laughs> of the um, of the uh, George Lucas Museum that he's been oh. working on? Oh yeah, well I mean we had lots of talk about that because George George was developing the um, uh, the designs uh, etc. And in fact, one of the I mean to to exp if if I just tell you a bit about um, the archives and the ranch right and the presidio right if you visit the presidio um uh, which is obviously all lucas from right um there are tons and tons of posters up up on the wall right and if you go into the the ranch and um, you go into the tech building which is skywalker sound yeah, there's um all posters everywhere it's a complete history of cinema there in every building it's incredible, right? I'm, you know, I like movies, I'm a film fan, right? And I would look up and I would see posters of like the birds mm -hmm. that I have never seen before. Mm. I never even knew existed, right? And George would have them pristine, enormous. Yeah, like six sheets, nine sheets, mm. you know, it would just like, from countries, you know, all over the world, yeah, just phenomenal um, uh, collection. And um, in fact, there was what I, I was staying on the ranch at the inn on the ranch, and uh, so I, over the weekends everything's closed, so I would have time to write because all day from you know ten till five or six or whenever uh, they took me out of the archives, and. Um, I then would go back to the to to the inn to my room. I then have to download uh, everything that I've either taken photographs of or copied or, or whatever. Um, I have to download them onto my computer, and I have to make up backup copies um, onto a hard drive. Yeah, to make sure I don't lose my day's work. Right, right. And, and I'm doing this over the weekend as well because mm -hmm. I have to annotate everything. Have to make these enormous spreadsheets you know of information and um, you know there's a lot more to it than just you know copy this copying that. stuff and yeah yeah it yeah, seems yeah. like it was a lot of work incredible amount and um and i had people helping me as well and um the uh, but on this on sunday i'd go for a walk because i need some exercise mm. and then um, go into the tech building uh, and I remember spending one one day just walking around every single corridor and nook and cranny of the tech building just to have my own private gallery, uh, gallery tour of all of those posters. Amazing. Just incredible. Cool. One Which of the one, guys actually told me to do that. You know, did, you know what, what, one thing that's, you know, that I find fascinating about George Lucas. Sorry, but uh, I didn't yeah, answer your question. So, yeah, yeah. But, but the thing is that those the posters is one thing you've then got original art you've got norman rockwell you've got uh, oh, wow. renoir 
you've got um, Maxfield Parish, as I've mentioned, uh, Wyeth. Um, you've got so many, uh, so many pieces of original art, okay, um, that are held in storage by George. Original comic art. Now, I started off um, reading comics and, in fact, doing my own uh, magazine, um, which is this arc, um, oh, which cool. I did for 10 years. You know, this is sweet. You know, um, this is like Will Eisner and Jack Kirby. Um, yeah. You know, you can see oh, that. Cool. You know, where I would interview all of these people and, um, uh, you know, about their creative process, etc. when I was a teenager in my 20s. Um, and then I go into the archive and I realise that they have original artwork there from all of these artists yeah. and all of the illustrators from the um, uh, from the last century and uh, fine artists as well and all of this is going into um the the lucas museum of narrative art oh interesting right interesting. as well as film material as well as storyboards and design work etc so i am so so excited about that and in fact george did Obviously, that came up in conversation because that was at the forefront of his mind. Mm -hmm. I remember um, he, he, he said, oh, tomorrow I've got to go to the, <laughs> um, you know, where they lay the first stone, yeah, to, um, to, to the first stone for it, you know, where they yeah. lay the concrete, and the first dig and all this sort of stuff. So he was really, built, really pumped for it. It's built on, on the original land that the first industrial light and magic uh was was uh, built in los angeles right it's it, it's in a similar place or something like that it's near usc oh, okay, right okay okay so maybe uh, not um and um but that first one's in burbank isn't it no it's in los angeles it's in uh, van noy van noy's it's the first uh island yeah. is in van noy's and yeah, which... uh, um but yeah so it's by usc um which is obviously where george went to school, to film school, uh, and he discovered film, if you like. He discovered that he loved film and also had a facility for film, for editing. And yeah. um, so, um, so yeah, so it's, it's been built there. And hopefully, fingers crossed, we'll all be able to, to go and visit there. Uh, yeah, I, I drove by the construction site when they were, when it was just all rubble and, and um, marked off. Yeah. Um, we're being extremely and, greedy with your and time there is, can i just say there's a website yeah. where for lucas museum of narrative art that you can you can visit and you can see more and they give examples of all the artwork and things that they have oh, and nice. there's some great pieces there what oh, when is the cool. opening supposed to happen i don't know yeah yeah well we should try to figure something out so that we can all go together and nerd out that'd be cool yeah, man you know yeah, yeah. Uh, all right so like like theory is saying we've been very you've been very generous with your time um we're 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 an hour and 20 minutes deep into this oh wait i, I thought we just started i have a lot more questions but i mean it's um, um so, so look to wrap up i have one more question in theory you can wrap it all up. Right, all right sure all right. um to me one of the things that i love about george lucas so much and why i'm such a big fan of his is because he's got this incredible human spirit that I can really aspire to be more like. And one of the biggest kind of uh, signatures of this is that, you know, Star Wars was definitely very heavily inspired by obviously the work of Joseph Campbell, the hero with a thousand faces and the hero's sure. journey. And Joseph Campbell throughout his life uh, spoke that him and George were very, very close and very friendly. But from a cinematic perspective, uh, a lot of the language of the film itself is definitely uh, sort of inspired by Akira Kurosawa. And for me, it was such a beautiful thing to see that as George got older in life, he almost wanted to give back to his two influences, to Joseph Campbell and to Akira Kurosawa by producing uh, the movie Ran. Uh, which, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, which I have up there. It's yeah, it's a, ma a masterpiece of cinema by Akira Kurosawa, produced by yeah. George Lucas. Um, when you were hanging out with George Lucas or looking through the archives, did you 
see any of this kind of Kurosawa linkage stuff? Well, um, I don't know how to explain. I mean, I did stay in the, um, at the end they have, um, each room is themed. All right. Oh, I see. Okay, yeah. Uh, and I stayed in the Kurosawa room oh, at the, nice, uh, nice, nice. in the uh, at the first time I was there, and um, so there are um, basically it's filled with Kurosawa books mm. and um, oh, really and cool. some of his uh, signed prints that yeah. Kurosawa did and things like that. So uh, so each of the rooms is is themed, which is is great. You know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's great for all the People who stay at the inn, you know, to, to wonder which which one you're going to get, and people have their favour. What and you always what meet the other themes. Sorry. Oh, what well, is... you get you, you get you know like Frank Lloyd Wright, or you get designers, filmmakers, artists, normal That's Rockwell. cool. So it's all like his inspirations, like exactly. His... Gotcha, exactly. gotcha, gotcha. That's Think, cool. Things that mean something. There are creative people that mean something to him. Okay. But I think that. Um. I think when you talk about Kurosawa, um, you talk about um, who, who I adore, you know, and seeing all his movies. Um, Kurosawa was somebody who was um, very deeply affected by the Kanto earthquake very early in his life, which he visited and saw, uh, and which he, uh, uh, which reverberated in his work. So the idea of um, chaos and, and death and rebuilding from that, you know, uh, Kurosawa understood, and those are themes that he um, uh, that he included in his work, like to live, etc. Uh, and also later on in, in dreams and uh, and other movies, he always has these uh, apocalyptic visions where yeah, people yeah. survive, and they they try to 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 grow better. They come back, yeah. Or they leave the world in a better place than they, they found it. And this is also something that I feel that uh, George um, has done and is doing. And that's one of the great things about, for example, being on the ranch and talking to people who have worked with George. Now, I did uh, most of the interview I did with, was with George. I did five days with him. But I also interviewed you know, Ben Burt and Doug Chang, Ron Church and uh, Eric Tiemens. Um, Dennis Muran, John Knoll, mm. uh, David Tattershall, you know, it's uh, David Tattershall, you know, I, I interviewed quite a few people and what you got was the feeling that George had um, allowed them to be creative and free. Yeah, he had allowed them to do what some of them said was their best work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, even though it's supposed to be within a commercial environment, etc. And that's a feeling that you get when you're in um, uh, at Skywalker Ranch, that that this is a place where people achieve the best that they can because it's an environment that was created by George uh, and by Rick McCallum for the um, uh, for the sequels. Uh, I met and interviewed Rick as well. Uh, that they, it's about creating an environment where people can be the best people that they can be. Yeah. yeah, to do things for the best of all possible reasons. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that is difficult to do. Yeah, that is, there are not many places in the world that you can go, that you can live, that you can work in, where you can say that working there, living there, being there, being in that company, um, makes me a better person and makes me feel good. Yeah. yeah. I remember uh, Mike Blanchard saying after uh, all these technical things were going wrong and, you know, uh, there were power cuts and the whole of the ranch had gone dark and he needed to get the power um, up. You know, he had to get a generator to get working so that George could carry on editing mm -hmm. um, uh, through the night, etc. And he said afterwards, you get it all done and you go out into the, the ranch um, and you, you'd walk out into the night and you think, yeah, this is a great place to work. Right, right. So, so the thing is that this is the message where he's 
he lives the message as well. Oh, and I think that's one of the great things about meeting George and being within that environment and that the whole experience of making these books over four or five years. Yeah, that's, that's um, beautiful. Is, is getting that from, um, uh, from George, from what he's created. Yeah. Theory, how do you want to wrap it up? I, you know, I, I don't know which question to choose. So I'm, I, I don't think I'll ask anything. I think I'll just. It was an absolute pleasure listening to you. And I'm gonna uh, ask one last thing, Theory. You <laughs> greedy bastard! <laughs> How can Theory and I get Rick McCollum on the podcast? We've been trying. We 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 made some progress at first, but then I think he's living in. I want to say it's Czechoslovakia. I'm not exactly sure which Eastern European country he's in, so forgive yeah. me. Um, but I, I know he spends a lot of his time in Europe. Um, is there any way that you can put in a good word for us? Because we want to get Rick on. Uh, no idea. You know, uh, all, all I know is that he has a crazy, crazy production schedule. He's got his own production company. Mm. And, you know, getting him away from it, I think you'll have a very difficult time. I think some of his programs, some of his shows have been uh, uh, re -upped. So I think he's really? going to be... Yeah. So he's doing TV now, huh? That That's like his main thing? He's doing multiple things. If you have a look at on his website, uh, on his uh, production company, I think it's called Limited or Unlimited Films or something like that. You, you'll find, um, uh, you'll, you'll see what he's been doing. I think he's done, yeah, he's, he's done a few very interesting projects, uh, which, you know, um, obviously he's having a great time doing. Yeah. Let me, let, let me actually cover one thing. There's, I was, I covered this, this part in the book that was, one of my favorite parts that uh, you put in there that George um, mentioned regarding the sort of theme of the whole of all six movies of, of, of Vader and Anakin. And I think it was I'm trying to find it on my phone. I think it was uh, Howard Kazanjian. Right. So it was. Yeah. OK. So it was in Return of the Jedi. And when um, Anakin was turning back into a force ghost after being Vader, after Luke took the mask off and sure. Vader dies. And something a lot of fans were always talking about was like, well, how, how can he just, you know, become a force ghost and Yoda and Obi-Wan, you know, stand next to him. And they're just like, Hey, how's it going? Like, it's all good. You did all those things. Don't worry about it. You're back with the light. And it was really beautiful how George actually explained this. And in the book, it says, um, Howard Kazanjian says, um, why this guy he's like hitler he's killed he's done all these terrible things and now we're saying he's equal with yoda and obi-wan as if he's gone to heaven or whatever george pointed at me he was real close and he says isn't that what your religion is all about and yeah. for me when i when i read that i was like you wow. know that yeah it, i never actually heard george speak about that in particular when someone asks how can Anakin just, you know, slum it with Yoda and Obi-Wan again and hang out with them after, you know, killing the younglings, turning his back on the Jedi Order and pretty much leading the destruction of the entire galaxy. And it comes down to the moral of the whole movie that you can forgive. Well, but isn't that the, the thing of all religions? And isn't that yeah, what, what Luke was doing? You know, Luke saying to, to Anakin, well, you're my dad. Yeah. Right. You've done terrible things, but yeah. I see good in you. Yeah. yeah? It was beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's all about compassion and forgiveness. Just to have that confirmed was um, from the man himself. It was, I remember reading that and I was like, wow, that's really beautiful. Well, isn't, isn't that what it's all about? The thing is yeah. that after war, after terrible things happen, people who have been neighbors, you know, who've been fighting against each other, have to come together, have to work together in order to rebuild something again. They right. have to find common ground and they have to you know, be big enough to take responsibility for, for their actions, mm -hmm. you know, but also to, to be big enough to forgive others for the things that they've done. Yeah. You know, so and these are all big, big things um, that George encodes in the movies. And again, it's just for 12 year olds. Yeah. Uh, these are things for, for kids. I didn't really um, 
I didn't really come to understand it until I did the book. Mm. Yeah. Um, and it was only, it's, it's like, I remember seeing episode one again and saying, why does symbiotic symbiosis, why is that mentioned twice? Mm -hmm. Right? Once, it's a bit weird. Why does he even mention it? Right. So I saw, and, and that's really when I talked to George about it, George yeah. just like, he was off. Yeah. <laughs> so he cool. was off for, you know, an hour or, or whatever, talking about that. Right. Because, right. Because I, I had, if you like, recognized. All right. I started when I was 15 reading comics, younger than that, but actually doing magazines and stuff. Yeah. Know, publishing my own stuff when I was 15. And over the years, when you go through different works of art or comics or books, you realize that the writers, you know, they're often thinking about something else as they're writing the thing, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But at some point, they give you the clue, right? Or the code word that can unlock the thing they're thinking about, right? And um, and there's a certain point where you begin to recognize them because you you've seen how many thousand stories in your lifetime, mm -hmm. yeah, and um, and you understand the construction of them. So when something pops out at you that's a little bit weird, you understand that that means something. So that's why I asked you. And and that was that was a key to unlocking not only those movies but the whole thing because that movie at one then becomes about symbiosis. Mm -hmm. It becomes about Naboo having two forces, one overground, one under on the water. Yeah, Obi Wan who talks are separate. About that. They need to come together to defeat a common enemy. Yeah. Right. I mean, you can think of it as, you know, on a microbiotic level as well, as being one part. But, um, but also the whole movie sets up the whole of the trilogy because you've got, um, um, you've got Padme, right? Who wants to do it through cooperation. She wants to solve the problem through cooperation. She goes to the Senate says blah 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 the senate says no so she realizes that cooperation is she can't do it with the help of the senate so she has to find somebody else to help her right yeah and she realizes that it's right there in front of her cooperation with um uh, the gungans and it's by being humble mm -hmm. and by revealing herself and um, by stepping outside of her disguise um, by losing all ego, mm -hmm. right, that she can form an alliance with the Gungans for, for defeat, to defeat the common enemy. Yeah, yeah, it's very well said. What, what does Anakin do? Anakin, throughout the movie, does everything by himself. He's self-reliant, right? He is there. You see it all, in fact, meticulously detailed in the pod race scene. Every single thing that happens in that pod race has to be solved by Anakin alone, right? So whether it's sabotage or um, something going wrong, this mm -hmm. thing pops out, you know, he knows how to solve the problem. He solves it. And this, so this is, and he does likewise, even though accidentally and with a bit of humor later on um, when he, destroys the control ship but ingrained in him is the idea from very early on that he is self-reliant that he can do it on his own so the two characters are set up one Padme who does it through cooperation and Anakin who does it on his own yeah so George very carefully then sets up every scene so that we can see that there is a difference between the two. And, um, and he set up the idea of this symbiotic relationship uh, so that as you follow it through, you see how these things fall apart 
yeah, and get used and abused, mm -hmm. uh, uh, leading to the dark side at the end of, of that three. Yeah. So, so it's not. That's cool. Nothing Very is cool. by accident in these movies. I um, I'm thinking about that scene in uh, Attack of the Clones, where um, at the end when they're fighting in the arena, and uh, Padme somehow is taking her own things in her own hand a little bit. Yeah. Um, and now to your point, now that I think about that scene again, and like, I think Obi wants something like she's on top of it or yeah. like something yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, and when she's climbing the, yeah, um, yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. When she's climbing the thing. And that's a little bit to your point. Now I'm thinking about it differently. It's a mm -hmm. little out of character for her to do that on like, cause that seems very self-reliant that move, you know? Yeah. But she'd, she's already realized that negotiations are pointless. Right. In fact, the, the, the real, um, um, there are missing scenes, if you like, oh, as well, yeah. okay. where, um, where there was there one with, with, with Dooku, um, where she talks with Dooku, where Dooku is oh, trying right. to persuade her, yeah. you know, of his point of view. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it was a, a deleted she, scene, right? It was in yeah, the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and then, um, yeah, so that was basically, and there was another scene uh, that I think also was deleted where Anakin and Padme are in front of the uh, Archduke. Yeah. Uh, is, Poggle yeah. the Lesser. Yeah. And yeah. then, um, so those two were written. So if you like, those were negotiations, right, that were then deleted. Uh, and, in, and those were replaced with the scene between Dooku and Obi Wan, interesting. Yeah? So that is, if you see, that is a negotiation as well, sure. Because Dooku is trying to negotiate um, uh, Obi Wan onto his side, right? Yeah, right. Dooku is such um, a cool character, man. By yeah, appealing by appealing that Qui Gon Jinn. Did he yeah. ever like, speak? Did George ever speak about Qui Gon? Uh, did he ever mention anything that? If it's in, if it's in the book, it's I included book? it. If, okay. Yeah. So th the thing is that these things are really um, um, towards the end of the book. We talk about uh, father, 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 fig father figures, and um, uh, really this idea that um, if you're um, a father and you have a son and you guide them to a certain point, mm -hmm. you never. You, there's a certain point where you have to let go. Yeah. And you have no control over what they do, which is essentially what Obi Wan's situation is with with Anakin. Although he tries to be more of a friend, stroke brother, elder brother type thing. Yeah. Character, and I think that uh, Qui Gon also falls into this, 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 this idea. And, and the thing is that you can't be responsible for what others do. Yeah, you can only be responsible for what you yourself do and how you act towards those those right. people. So acting in a responsible and adult manner. Right. Yeah. So all of these characters are always playing this, this um, you know, and if if there are scenes that repeat that seem similar, it's because the characters themselves have developed um, between the scenes. And so how they act and react will change depend upon depending upon their new perspective. So this is very much um, how you would look at uh, Leah and Han in episodes four, five, and six, mm -hmm. in that Leah is completely selfless and Han is selfish mm. completely. Right. And so they act in that manner. Right. But as it goes through... They begin to take on the the other aspects in order to find a balance in their characters, yeah, yeah, yeah. which is good for themselves because yeah. nobody can be totally selfless. No. Yeah. yeah. yeah that's Otherwise, true. you have to to be totally selfless. You have to give away everything you you own, everything right. you know, everything you wear, um, and that way you cannot build anything either for yourself or a family. Right. Yeah. So you, you have to find a balance, you know, between the selfish and, and the selfless. So what George is showing in the development of those characters is how they find uh, a balance through each other, through their interaction. 
beautiful. Dude, yeah. Well, you've given uh, me a lot to think about. That's for yeah, sure. Yeah, a ton. I, I, one last this question. Is, so, what, This what, is all George. You've got to remember, this is all George's writing. Right. Yeah, but it's always good it's, to interpret. It's always good to, to yeah, your interpretations of that. And I, what is the, so I have the original, the, the large one, the Star Wars archives, they're publishing another one that's smaller behind you? Uh, yeah, it's already out, uh, which is this. Yeah, I've seen some people pick it up, but what's the difference? Yeah. Uh, basically, it's much smaller, <laughs> right? So it's, um, this is 500 images instead of 1,200 images in the big oh, one. So you lose out, okay. Yeah, it's obviously much smaller. So, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the, the, most, the same story is there, essential story, but there is, there are fewer words, obviously. Right, okay. Very, and it's much cheaper. Yeah. yeah. So I found when I was doing the James Bond book, for example, that people would, they would buy the cheap version, right, but love it so much that they then yeah. go buy the expensive version yeah. because they, they already know that they like it, yeah. right? And also, um, um, you can read in the big version, you can see every little detail of every single document that's in there. Yep. You know, you, you can read it all. So, um, Is so there there's actually... one coming out as well? No, the, he, they, they, the, oh, like the small one, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, no, there's, there's nothing planned. I mean, I, I I can see what's coming up, and there's nothing planned. No, no, right, right, but I meant like a little smaller version, because that's the smaller version of the original trilogy. Arc. Yeah, there's not a smaller version planned for the, the gotcha, prequel one. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Well, look, you know, one day, one day, if you're up for it, I know this is totally off topic, but I, I, I'm, you know, I think Igmar Bergman is probably pound for pound, maybe you know, second only to Stanley Kubrick in my brain as like a filmmaker. Yeah. So. I'd love to hear all the insights you have into Bergman. You just seem like a fascinating guy. So hopefully I'll get a chance to talk to you again one day. Sure. It'd be, be my pleasure. Cool. That'd be really nice. I, I learned a lot and I really enjoyed this interview. I've been waiting to speak with you for many, many months. And uh, I can't wait to actually finish the entire book because there's just I've, so much information in there. You what haven't is, read the book. I can't believe it. I've re no, I've read. Mark hasn't read the book. I haven't All read right. the book. I confess, I have not read the book. But put 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 put, put the. I've been looking forward to this. I think, yeah. I think I've read seventy five percent of the whole of. of <laughs> the, they do book. come with health warnings. The um the Ingmar Bergman book, uh, the okay. novelist uh, when when it came out, the novelist uh, Henning Menkel, who does the Wallander books, uh, who who's married into the Bergman family, was a friend of, of Bergman. You've got the Bergman book, which is that XXL size. Yeah, I've got both, yeah. Yeah, and he got, he got the um, Ingmar Bergman archives, and he tried reading it in bed, right? Oh, boy, uh, and he fell and asleep. No, it was worse than that. The thing is that it was so heavy, it cut off circulation to his legs. Oh, my And he had Lord. to jump out of bed because he, like, he couldn't feel his legs anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not a book for bedtime. That's not There's a actually a health warning for this? No way. Well, I, I'm, I'm giving it now just because. Right, right. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah, well, it right. makes sense. I mean, these things are just freaking Beautiful. heavy. Well, but remember, y'all, go check out StarWarsTheories.com. We just released a bunch of new features on there. And uh, we'll let you guys know when the next rule of two is coming is coming out. And uh, check out all of Paul's links in the description below, and you can find all of his books online on Amazon, uh, on his website, and um, so it's right it there. Oh yeah, yeah. You know what? Put, yeah. that, put that link. With, I already put it in the description. All right, cool. yeah. right there. And um, what I've been uh, doing because of the unfortunate situation that we find ourselves in the world, uh, I've put together these uh, bookmarks and um, or book plates, whatever you call it. Uh, and I've been doing signed versions of these and sending them out. And they're available cool. through my my website. So I sign them all to everybody. And those have been awesome. fine. Because cool. unfortunately, we can't travel. So yeah, yeah. not at the moment. Soon, soon. Yeah. Maybe we'll see each other at the uh, Lucas Film Museum. Fingers crossed. And then we can all say, I've been looking forward to this. <laughs> <laughs> Well timed. Well timed. <laughs> okay. okay. Well, thanks everybody. We'll catch you later. And thank you, Paul.